one change that took place about three years ago, and this has to do with consent for minors, uh, is related to, as many of you know, the outpatient mental health and crisis residential exception. I think most of you, how many of you here work with teens or kids who are you know, 12 or older? Okay, so a few of you do. Um, the law changed about three years ago, uh, but we've had for many, many years, since in some of these rules since the 1950s, that minors could become emancipated uh, at the age of 14 or older with a court involvement um, in some circumstances and consent to just about anything. Or 12 years of age or older, they could choose for themselves to get outpatient mental health and crisis residential services. Or they could also, 12 years of age or older, choose to engage in drug and alcohol related counseling. Now, there are criteria that have to be met. But, um, and these are just some, some references for you. Most organizations will still and should get consent from parents first. And this is San Mateo County's site had actually a nice consent form. And then San Francisco has a great checklist that was put together in 2009 about whether a youngster meets the criteria to consent herself or himself for services if they're under the age of 18. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, what that, and it makes some sense because this, that was crafted in 2009 and the law was passed uh, in 2010, but the Health and Safety Code section 124260 um, was not included in that list for San Francisco City and County. And those of you who work around minors know this one. Previously, and actually it still exists in a different section, in order for a teenager to consent to treatment, she or he had to be 12 years of age or older, mature enough to participate intelligently in treatment. Um, there's a student of Dr. Michaels here at CSPP who's studying how clinicians understand that particular standard, people who work with kids, because what does that mean? There's no parallel in the developmental literature. What would be, Joe, mature enough to participate intelligently in treatment? Could you be six? What 12-year-old do you think would make a good decision about that? I mean, that, this, this is like, how are, we supposed to, how are we supposed to decide this, right? But the other criteria included in the previous and ongoing law, this is um, the Family Code section 6924, um, that the minor has to be, in our judgment as clinicians, at a risk of harming themselves or others physically or emotionally if treatment is not provided. And then if that cri those criteria are met, we can proceed with treatment with the minor's consent, assuming they're 12 or older, and we're supposed to notify the parents unless we document that it is inappropriate and we give a reason for why. Okay. The problem is that kids were seeing this particular standard as having kind of a high standard for harm. And as some of you may know, the Mental Health um, Services Act that was passed in 2004 created a series of task forces to try to address stigma related to mental illness. And they were trying, this particular task force was interviewing family members and kids who were lesbian, gay, transgender, questioning, um, adolescents about why they weren't coming in and getting services more under the family code. And from what I understand, the kids in our communities were saying, but we're not going to harm ourselves or somebody else. They were seeing it as being kind of very concrete and that the bar was too high. So the task force made a recommendation to our legislature and they said we need to remove this harm standard as it was called and instead just go with 12 years of age or older and mature enough to participate intelligently in treatment. This law was passed three years ago, although we're not in great shape, um, actually almost three years ago to the day, uh, given, a, given a week or a week and a half. Um, it removes, it's 124.260 of the Health and Safety Code, it removes the requirement of harm to the child or Alice or somebody else just are they mature enough to participate intelligently in treatment, and are they 12 years of age or older? We are still required to notify parents, okay, unless we believe it's contraindicated. And one of the hard parts about this is that what was happening in 2010 was, well, it's still happening to some degree, the state was in dire financial straits. So in order to get this bill passed, they had to say that the state wouldn't have to fund the services. So sure enough, 
in the Welfare and Institutions Code, Section 14029.8, it says if kids consent under the health and safety, this particular health and safety code, there's no state funding. So what this means is we either provide the services for free or it comes from some other direction. Okay. Um, now, keep in mind, and the reason I'm emphasizing this latter part is keep in mind that this is an exception to the generally accepted constitutional rule that parents consent on behalf of their minors. That hasn't disappeared. This is an exception, not the rule. So I've been asked by a, a number of different folks, a um, you know, number of students who are working in different settings where they say, oh, now kids can consent to anything they want to from 12 years of age and older. Only if they come on their own steam, if they are mature enough to participate intelligently in treatment, and they're 12 years of age or older. If their parents bring them in, the parents consent on their behalf. This is only a very limited, to use the, the legal terms, medical emancipation. Okay? So I would encourage you to be cautious and not just assume if you do see minors that um, because we have this new law, we do not have to seek involvement of parents. The law explicitly says we do, and we have to justify if we don't. There are five other exceptions in addition to the three that I mentioned. One of them is pregnancy-related medical care and prevention. Others include things like uh, when a 12-year-old has been raped, when a child of any age has experienced sexual assault, if uh, the child comes in for treatment for a communicable disease. Um, those are, and, and then the classic kind of mature minor for dental or medical services, um, 15 years of age, whatever basis, you know, their runaway exception is what we called it. Well, abortion is within the pregnancy-related treatment. Uh, and the, the thing that's paradoxical is that this requires a kid to be 12 years of age or older, but if a minor is physically mature enough to be pregnant at 10 or 11, she can choose an abortion merely with the advice of her doctor, and there is a clear privacy standard in California that says that their parents do not get notified. There's an affirmative rule that says parents do not get notified. Uh, it's a, it's a Vanderkamp, uh, the, the AAP versus Vanderkamp in 1997. Um, uh, and so that, that's a constitutional ruling by our Supreme Court in California. Uh, so this, for our purposes, now, you're not going to do ongoing treatment. One second, Pat. But you're not going to do ongoing treatment in the other kind of medically oriented services. You might do an initial interview or two. This is the one of two that allows us to do ongoing treatment for just mental health related concerns. Well, no, remember, the harm standard is gone. It doesn't even have to be harmful if they didn't. Right? It's much more broad. But this is mental health services, Pat. This is not, this is, I mean, substance abuse is also 12 years of age and older with some restrictions, but this is for mental health services, counseling services. The pregnancy related services, no age limit, no parental consent. Um, for some other services, like for communicable diseases, 12 years of age or older. Um, for rape, 12 years of age or older. So there are, it doesn't quite wipe them out, but it does say that if they come in for, f to you and they want you to provide therapy, if you think they're mature enough to participate intelligently in treatment, they're permitted to legally consent in this limited capacity. And you, don't have, you, you have to contact parents and try to involve them unless you think it's contraindicated. And then you document it. So it's pretty broad. Any standard for contraindicated? None. There's no case law. Um, I would assume that if you thought, this is where you might reintroduce, sneak back the, the harm standard a little bit. If you thought the minor, the minor said, you know, my dad will kill me. With, with the, the lesbian, gay, transgender kids, queer kids, Many of them feel like if they tell their parents, they'll be kicked out of the house, they might be beaten, there may be all kinds of negative repercussions. And if you think that's realistic, then you could say this is a basis for not contacting parents. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a bias towards trying to involve families for good reason. You know, so um, it's a question about whether, you know, if you have a 14-year-old who says, my mom hates therapy, she thinks it's stupid, she doesn't want anybody being in therapy, um, she'll say no. Well, actually, that's probably not a sufficient justification because that minor is legally permitted to say yes and has come into you on her own steam. So she can say yes even if parents say no. Mm -hmm. And there, there are some cases, but they're, they're not in this particular area, but they suggest that the courts are going to back us up.
Well, if they have Medi-Cal, then what you have to do is you have to go up in my slides a little bit here. You have to go to the outpatient residential exception. You can't use and get Medi-Cal for the kids 124, 260. The law says you can't do that. But it, the other one wasn't repealed. So we have two sections, one with the harm standard and one without. If you meet the harm standard, kids can get Medi-Cal funding. If you don't, they can't. And this has been emerging in Kaiser, where parents have access to their minors' records. So um, if a child comes in, seeks services, they're legally allowed to get services, the parent pretty much is going to be notified, among other things, if there's a copay, um, the minor may pay it or the parent may get billed and the minor doesn't know that. So um, the region, you know, northern region, southern region are beginning to try to work out how to address this issue of parents of kids coming in on their own when the law allows it, but it's a private um, health care provider, so they don't have to allow it. They can say, well, we have to notify your parents because parents or parents' employers are paying for the insurance. So it's, it gets a little bit tricky. You're absolutely right. It does get tricky with, with private insurance. You know, how does it impact notifying the non-custodial parent? Probably it's not a whole lot different than the old rule. Um, if, we if we believe there's not a reason to notify the parents, then you don't notify either. If you think there's the basis for notifying the non-custodial, and usually that means non-physically custodial. As you know, the, you know the, the modal custodial arrangement in California and in most places in the United States is joint legal custody with primary physical custody, with usually, usually with moms. Okay? Even though men have had increasing numbers and percentages of having primary legal, I'm sorry, primary uh, physical custody, it's still, there's still quite a, a significant imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, we can't assume that because a parent does not have physical custody that she or he does not have legal custody, in which case they can make decisions about this. So we would be treating it very similarly as we would have in the previous situation, previous law. The only thing that's different is that the harm standard has been removed. It's no longer there. going for a couple more minutes. Um, one of the things that's happened this year, well, some of you may know, as of uh, September 26, 2012, Governor Brown signed into law a statute that made it illegal in California for parents to bring children in for services to get their sexual orientation changed. These are called sexual orientation change efforts. It was supported by APA, CPA, you name it, all the mental health professions were in support. And this, just the definition here in one of your slides under, sec, it's a Business and Professions Code section 865A and B. 865.1 says, under no circumstances shall a mental health provider engage in sexual orientation change efforts with a patient under 18 years of age. Now, what that means is if I'm 18, or above, I can choose to go into therapy with someone and say, I want to change my sexual orientation. Okay? But if I'm a minor, my parents cannot consent to it. This, as you might imagine, raised quite a furor. A lot of, a lot of um, controversy about this particular provision because at least some parents believe that it's their right to try to do this. Um, and what happened, what was supposed to happen was as, as of the first of this year, January 1st, 2013, SB 1172, so that was the, the name of the law when it was passed, was supposed to go into effect. But within about two months after the law was passed, was signed into law by uh, Governor Brown, on September 30th, was, no, no, sorry, September 30th, not September 26th, on um, November 26th, Judge Shubb, who's a federal district court judge, in Sacramento ruled on um, a case that came before him. And he said that it might violate the United States Constitution, First Amendment rights to free speech, and he enjoined the enforcement of the statute, but just between the two parties, okay. between the folks who were suing the state and, the, and the, the two parties. The next day, Judge Mueller, by the way, Judge Shub was a uh, Bush appointee and Judge Mueller was an Obama appointee. <laughs> um, Sacramento Federal District Court Judge Mueller refused to enjoin the enforcement and said this was a constitutional law. This was actually, per they forum shopped on purpose because you can't really appeal a case 
unless there are judgments that are conflicting. So they got their conflicting judgments. And then the folks who wanted to appeal this and take it into the federal system brought it to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. They first asked for an injunction against its enforcement. And the Circuit Court, the U.S. Court of Appeals, issued that an injunction on December 12th. They said, the law does not go into effect until we rule on it. They, they heard oral argument, actually it's it, it, not longer than four months, but they heard or, oral argument on April 17th. And they took a long time to get supplemental briefings. They actually put up a web page with all of the briefs that were submitted, the amicus briefs and all the people were commenting on some fascinating briefs. Um, and they were just deciding in May or June whether to expand their review of the statute from the relatively narrow issue of whether it violated um, freedom of speech and then fundamental uh, rights of parents to a broader issue. Um, notably, New Jersey and Massachusetts had passed similar statutes in recent months. So there's a possibility that this could go up to the Supreme Court if various districts differ. Um, the so the um, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, however, ruled, and they just did so on August 29th, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, the issue they ruled on was whether this violated therapists' freedom of speech and parents' fundamental rights to control the upbringing of their children. Um, the First Amendment idea is not the best argument because the, the government gets to limit speech in many ways of professionals. For example, they get to say things to us like, you can't misrepresent your credentials. Um, you can't make promises that you can't keep, things like that. So typically, if there's a compelling state interest, the state can limit speech. So it's not a very strong argument to begin with. Um, in keeping with what I kind of expected, although I wasn't really sure, in Pickup versus Brown, the appeals court ruled that there was no violation of the First Amendment nor other constitutional fundamental rights, and the law was not overly broad. So it now they lifted their injunction, and it is now in effect. Where we may see some change here is if other states or other district courts, sorry, uh, appellate courts, decide differently, and then it gets brought up to the Supreme Court. For now, however, it is a valid law, um, SB. 1172 is a valid law in California. So if a parent brings a child to you to change the child's sexual orientation, you cannot provide those services. Okay. So now they take them to their pastor. They can. Mm -hmm. right. They can take them to a religious practitioner, but they can't take them to a licensed therapist. If your religious beliefs dictate this, then you take them to your pastor. But if the pastor is a licensed mental health professional, they can't. Problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, it's going to be tricky because there are a few, right? They're going to have to be very clear what role they're in. Otherwise, they'll be violating 1172. Right. So this is relatively new in terms of the development. It's, um, it's a big step in many respects. But it, um, we will have to see how this story plays out over time. It may, in fact, just stay here if most appellate courts, if there are two or three that rule that this does not violate um, First Amendment concerns or fundamental parental rights uh, ideas. Um, but we're just going to have to wait and see. It is currently the law in California and in the, in the, um, in the we are the, we are the um, uh, jurisdiction within which that law passed. If other Ninth Circuit jurisdictions pass similar laws like Washington State, then there would be no contest. It's just the law the way, the way the law is. It's accepted. Right. 